The National Eucharistic Congress is coming to Indianapolis July 17th through the 21st. Make plans now to be there for this pivotal moment for the Catholic Church in the United States. Register today at EWTN.com forward slash Eucharist and get a special discount. Come find joy, healing, and peace. The National Eucharistic Congress July 17th through 21st in Indianapolis. Live Truth. Live Catholic. The Synod on Synodality rolls on this week. So does Synod Central. Editor-in-Chief of the CatholicThing.org, Robert Royal, joins us from Rome. And two Chinese bishops leave the Synod early. But why? President Emeritus of the Acton Institute, Father Robert Sirico, reacts and shares his new book, Hell contra mundum. Finally, Oxford University professor N.T. Wright dives deep into St. Paul's letters to the Romans. The world over begins right now. Now, Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. If you'd like to comment on tonight's show, send me an ex post. I'm at Raymond Arroyo. Lots to get to. Let's dive into it. Synod Central returns. Joining me with an update on what's been happening in Rome this week at the Synod on Synodality, I'm joined by editor in chief of the Catholic Thing.org, member of the Papal Posse, Robert Royal. Bob, we, are, we have a smaller group discussion this week without Father Murray. He's traveling, but uh, we'll have him back next week. Uh, I want to start with probably the biggest news from Rome. One of the 13 members of the committee drafting the final summary document of this Senate has publicly expressed openness to ordaining women deacons. Australian Bishop Shane McInlay made the admission in an interview podcast with the National Catholic Reporter, saying, quote, I'm glad it's being discussed, and if it were to be that the outcome was for ordination to the diaconate to be open to women, I'd certainly welcome that, end quote. Bob, first, your thoughts on this admission, considering that uh, McInlay is on the drafting committee. Is this one of the preordained outcomes about which we spoke last week? Yeah, you know, we've received a lot of criticism because we predicted that these so-called hot-button issues are really uh, going to come to some kind of fruition, if not in this episode, then in next October 2024's episode mm -hmm. of this uh, Synod on Synodality. And we know that uh, the Relator General of the, uh, the Synod, uh, Cardinal Jean-Claude uh, Hollerick has already t said that he believes that the church's teaching on homosexuality is incorrect, and he, he has actually even, I, I think, let the cat out of the bag that he said that the Pope believes the same thing. So I'm not surprised that uh, this other issue about women being ordained as deaconesses has come up. It's a little surprising that that's said uh, quite so openly. But we see that while on the one hand we're being told that what's being discussed here is simply the process of what is synodality, at the same time behind the scenes I think we have to say that the, that the entire momentum of the synod is in that direction of these progressive issues. And all the, all the, the denials to the contrary, uh, we don't see it moving in, in a more traditional direction for sure. Yeah, well, you know, it reminds me of what Cardinal Mueller told us the very first week. You know, everything seems to be fine up front. It's what's happening behind the curtains that he was worried about and probably wise counsel. Uh, right. Cardinal Mueller, incidentally, two weeks ago while we're talking of him, Cardinal Mueller was scolded for coming on this program by Christopher Lamb of the National Catholic Reporter. He pressed the Vatican about whether Mueller should be punished. And, uh, he, you know, he sent that tweet out in response to my question about whether Cardinal Mueller's decision to give an interview to EWTN about the Senate affects the rules about confidentiality, Paolo Ruffini said 
it was up to each synod member to exercise his own discernment. That was Christopher Lamb's ex post. But now we have another synod participant, Bishop McInlay, making an admission about the actual discussions taking place in the synod, something Mueller never did. Well, you know, we said this very early on that uh, you've got basically almost 400 participants in this event. And the idea that somehow there wouldn't be people talking to sympathetic reporters, it was just unrealistic that this is what happens in Rome. It happens in every event. It happens even in papal conclaves. We're, we're never supposed to find out who, who voted in what ways in papal con conclaves, but eventually we, we do find this out. So, you yeah. know, it's... There's there's a bit of hypocrisy on the part of those who are trying to rein in a more traditional figure uh, like Cardinal Mueller, while at the same time these same outlets, America, which is a Jesuit publication in the United States, the National Catholic Reporter, both of which are, are I, th I think we have to say candidly, are much more... They're much closer to the Synod organizers. Uh, they've been getting information, yeah. and although sometimes they present it from anonymous sources, they, they're getting it. Yeah. yeah, it's being fed from sources who are in the leadership of this synod, no doubt. And regarding the final reports, Bob, Vatican spokesman Paolo Ruffini uh, announced that the Vatican won't make public the name of the experts helping the commission draft the final summary of whatever this is. Ruffini even referred to the experts as Sherpas in the drafting process. Now, Bob, this seems like more double talk. I mean, dialogue <laughs> and discussion, but we aren't allowed to know who's providing input and shaping the committee's final assessment. What are they afraid of? Well, that's a good question, isn't it? I mean, th this has been very carefully controlled. Uh, I, I think we know that in the past, the Holy Father wanted to arrive at certain uh, conclusions in the, the various synods that he's, he's uh, convened. And he hasn't gotten there. So there's been an effort, I think, to be much more tightly controlled, and they've learned something from the past in how to do this. That's why the, the structure of the conversations, mm -hmm. I think, has been very frustrating for a number of the participants. We kind of hear that leaking out that, you know, you have three minutes and you have to get in line. And if you're not in the first 15, you don't get a chance to speak. And, um, you know, all, all those things that have been put in place to, to kind of make sure that the, the conversation is very carefully controlled. And I think we also know in advance that the, 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 um, the final report is going to be written in a certain direction, too, even though, as we just said, these, there are not supposed to be substantive issues discussed. The, the, it, we're not exactly sure about the process of what's going to happen. It's going to be written and it's going to be presented to the participants next Saturday morning. They're going to have several hours to look it over, and then they're, there is what is called a, a kind of a approval. That, that's already the word in the official uh, schedule of what's mm -hmm. going to happen. There's going to be an approval, and we don't know if it's quite going to be voting on individual points or just kind of uh, uh, voting that uh, th this is what was discussed. But, you know, this is a this is a synod which says that the process th of synodality is going to define what a synod is. So it it's a work in progress. Yeah, Bob, they could call this thing the, the synod of the bum's rush. I mean, everybody's rushed through. The Holy Spirit must only speak in three-minute increments, I guess. No more, no less. And you've got to quickly move things along. By the way, one of the experts that are shaping this final uh, product, the final summary, is Austin Ivory, who, uh, you know, was very vocal about, oh, I, I'm an expert, I've been chosen as an expert, who it was a papal biographer and kind of a, you know, he, he, he's a, a message boy for many of those around the Pope. He kind of just goes out and does interference for uh, those nearest uh, this vision of where the church should go. And speaking of Paolo Ruffini, who we spoke a moment ago, the Vatican spokesman, he talked a little about the relationship between the Synod Assembly and the information that's trickling out about the discussions in the media, Bob, some of which you've been talking to and speaking about, saying the deliberations are not just a round table and they aren't a talk show designed for media. He also called the Synod a conversation in the spirit. And he's probably right, Bob. I would describe this thing not as a talk show, but as a show with talk. What do you make of this conversation with the spirit narrative? Well, you know, we're hearing that people are, are tired. In fact, uh, Cardinal Holerick, again, the, the relator general of the, uh, of the whole Synod, um, made a statement yesterday in which he said to the participants, look, we shouldn't be like school children through the last week of class after the exams have been taken. We slack off, that we, we, we've got things to do to, to uh, consider what synodality is in, in this last week. But 
look, when, when we when we're told that there are not going to be specific issues discussed in this month's synod and that those are going to be put off to 2024, at the same time, we're not hearing that there's a lot going on in the discussion of what actual synodality is. There, there seems to be among these theologians, I've noticed that there's a kind of a tripartite analysis that they're using. And if you wanted a, a kind of a way to remember this, it looks like, you know, the people of God are sort of like a, a uh, the House of Representatives in a government. And then the, the bishops, the College of Bishops are sort of like a Senate. And then the Pope is like a, a, a president. And they're, they're mm. talking in terms of trying to, um, I, I guess, advance a structure, although we don't know exactly what's going to happen with the report. Um, there's, there are questions about they're going to take these uh, this report back to dioceses and parishes and talk about it and then bring the reactions back here. There's a lot that's still up in the air and I think has been deliberately left up in the air. And by the way, something almost no one is talking about, the Germans have been extremely and suspiciously silent. Yeah, well, Bob, of course they're silent. Everything they've already enacted in their synodal way is now being enacted in the global church. When, everybody, when someone else is doing your will, Bob, you just sit back and get the popcorn. You don't have to get involved or get messy. I don't blame the Germans. Here's my question. All this talk of conversation with the Holy Spirit, you've got 400 people. You've got lay people. You've got, you got uh, young people. You've got nuns. You've got bishops. You've got priests. You've got non catholic Everybody and their dog is in this thing. And then you've got the Pope. My question is, does the Holy Spirit contradict himself? And who is to determine that the Spirit driving these discussions is the Holy Spirit? Just a question. Just a question. Uh, there was a female theologian, and this is a really interesting point, a female theologian participating in the Synod. She made an interesting observation regarding the discussions of women ordination this week, or female ordination. Uh, Australian theologian Renee Collar-Ryan, she said, she's one of the 54 women delegates at the Synod, um, and she called women priests slash deacons a niche issue distracting from a discussion about what women really need. Listen. As a woman, I'm not focused at all on the fact that I'm not a priest. I think that there's too much emphasis placed on this question. And what happens when we place too much emphasis on this question is that we forget about what women, for the most part, need throughout the world. Now, I was told, Bob, that uh, some theologian, we don't know a nameless one, but I'll bet it's her, stood up and made this um, comment during the synod itself, and it was greeted with wide applause. Uh, Cole Ryan, by the way, says greater support for families and working mothers is a much more necessary conversation. Your reaction? Yeah, I've said myself that I, I think that one of the things that the, the synod is missing is that there needs to be you know, there, I've used this term before that we're, we're in a period of what's sometimes called liquid modernity, where everything from the family to the church to the nation, um, all these things are kind of slipping away. Our educational system, our universities, the church has historically been a kind of stabilizing influence uh, throughout history. And if you want some emphasis on what would attract people right now, well, this, these, I, I think she's right to use the the, the niche is issues and and. We're hearing that there was great applause when she said that. On the other hand, we heard also that there was great applause when someone uh, proposed further um, discernment about the LGBT <laughs> issues. So, you know, how much of a mix inside the, the, the Senate hall is either progressive or more traditional is a bit hard to determine. But truly, if, if, if what the purpose of the Senate is, is to restructure some practices in the church so that it is a greater instrument of evangelization, of bringing people to Jesus, um, these niche issues for women or for LGBTs are not exactly about to create a great flood of people flocking to the church. The church needs to help support people yeah. who find themselves threatened by a great deal that's going on in our modern and postmodern world. Yeah. Bob, another big story this week was the Pope's warm reception of Sister Janine Gramic. She is the co-founder of New Ways Ministry, which is a Catholic gay advocacy group. Um, and as many might recall, Sister Gramic was a close friend and promoter of the disgraced pedophile former priest Paul Shanley. 
Francis met with Gramic for nearly an hour, and New Way's ministry has been previously sanctioned by both the Vatican and the USCCB and several bishops. Um, you know, Bob, the traditional Latin Mass is essentially verboten. There's no time to meet with Cardinal Joseph Zen. Faithful Chinese Catholics are an afterthought, but the Pope is an hour for Sister Gramic and company. Yeah, there are some people who try to bend over backwards to say, you know, meeting with somebody is not uh, an endorsement of all their views. He also met with Whoopi Goldberg this week, as, uh, as you know, <laughs> Raymond. Um, I mean, how can yes. we read this? How can, I mean, how can we truly read that in the midst of a synod in which the Pope himself, we hear through the grapevine, knows is there, are, there are a lot of there's a lot of anger out there and there's a lot of confusion. And, and people don't exactly know which way to turn and what's happening. How can you meet with someone like this? I mean, let's not forget, he also sent her a letter uh, a few years mm -hmm. ago claiming that she she works in the style of God and she had been basically persecuted. So I, I don't think we can bend over backward and say, well, okay, so he's practicing synodality and showing that he can even meet with someone who directly contradicts the teaching of the church on LGBT questions because... I think you'd have to be quite naive to think that all she is a asking for is greater kindness and receptiveness to people who are same self attracted. I think you know she and Brother James Martin and others have really been actively trying to promote a change in the teaching, even though they will never admit it. But to have met with her, when on the one hand you're telling people, well, no, we we can't change scripture, we have to believe in the truth, and to have met with her is actually, I, I think, to to make a statement that ultimately. This kind of receptivity is going to lead to something uh, quite different. And um, I, I don't know any other interpretation. It, it just seems to me that this cannot simply be, yeah, I met with somebody who, who has a different point of view than I did. This is, this is a, a, a raising of the subtext to the text, it seems to me. Uh, Bob, Pope Francis also gave an interview to an Argentinian media outlet this week uh, talking about change in the church. Uh, I'm going to put this up. He said, since the Second Vatican Council, John the Twenty-Third had a very clear perception. The church has to change. Paul the Sixth agreed, just like the succeeding popes. It's not just changing ways. It's about a change of growth in favor of the dignity of people. That's theological progression of moral theology in all the ecclesiastical sciences, even in the interpretation of scriptures that have progressed according to the feelings of the church. The church has to change. Let's think of the ways it has changed since the council until now and the way it must continue changing its ways in the way to propose an unchanging truth. That is, the revelation of Jesus Christ does not change. The dogmas of the church do not change. They grow and ennoble themselves like the sap of a tree. The person who does not follow this path follows a path that takes steps backwards, a path that closes in on itself. That's the quote, end quote. Bob, your thoughts on the Pope's notion of change here. He and his doctrinal chief always say dogma doesn't change as they call for change. What is the change being urged then? Well, this question of dignity begs, it begs the whole history of the church as if we didn't uh, we didn't affirm human dignity in the past which we actually have as, as a a dimension of what the truth is about human beings created in the image and likeness of god it's just that they want to emphasize a a, a a different way of approaching but the the emphasis on that different approach starts to bleed into changes in actual teaching listen there was a facebook post by Cardinal um, Victor Manuel uh, Fernandez, who is now the, the mm -hmm. head of the dicastery for the, the doctrine of the faith. Now, why he chose to, to publish this via Facebook, I don't know, but it's been reported on a lot in the Italian press. That in it, he mm -hmm. says, you know, we, we shouldn't even be using terms like peccatori, sinners, or sodomy. Uh, or illegitimate children, because they, they wound a person's dignity. Well. You know, the church exists for the sake of sinners. God came to the world to redeem sinners. We are all sinners. If we can't talk about people being sinners, what is the purpose of Christianity? So, you know, to me, yes, uh, you know, you want to emphasize dignity. You want to be kinder to people. I've got no quarrel with that. But be kind in the truth. 
practice caritas in veritate, as someone recently said. No, this is, this is why allowing somebody to persist in their ruin is not uh, being kind, gentle, or thoughtful of their dignity. In fact, it's undignified, the way they're proceeding, which is what I thought Jesus came for. Maybe we're all in error, and it's just, uh, you know, it's evolving, growing and evolving like sap out of a tree, Bob. Uh, this week, Paolo Ruffini, the Vatican press officer, reported that the Synod discussed, quote, reestablishment of women deacons and using inclusive language. We need a new spiritual intelligence of the church, he said, end quote. Now, what I see, Bob, is not spiritual intelligence, but spiritual amnesia. For all the warnings of going backward, this entire synodal agenda is looking backwards to the 1970s and 80s. I mean, whether ordination of women or inclusive language, these were battles that Mother Angelica and Cardinal O'Connor and Ratzinger and JP2 fought 30 years ago. They're not, they've not only fought them, they corrected the errors contained in them. There is no reestablishment of female deacons. They were assistants at baptisms, not ordained deacons, so you can't reestablish them. This is so disingenuous, and, and I have to say, uh, for the record, they are historic lies, and they're being peddled and washed through the Vatican press office itself, which is so uh, upsetting and raging and frankly disrespectful to the last two popes and their legacies. Bob, your reaction to this spiritual intelligence idea? Yeah, I, when I saw that quotation from uh, 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 Paolo Ruffini, too, I really focused on that word reestablishment as well, because he's typically uh -huh. been trying to stay away from taking positions, you know, that might, might give the impression that the, 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 there is an agenda uh, other than the discussion of, you know, what, what what should the church look like moving forward? You know, we keep hearing these two things over and over again. Mm -hmm. And I hear from some people that it's mind-numbing how how the general um, uh, congregations <laughs> where people make public lectures, they kind of repeat those, those buzzwords over and over again. And I, I think it's been established beyond all doubt that there were no deaconesses, as you rightly say. So to, 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 to use that term... I think might have been in an, an unguarded moment in which he revealed something that um, we've all been suspecting mm. for quite a while. Yeah. Bob, with the winds of change in mind, Colombian Archbishop Jose Gomez Rodriguez talked to ACI Presa about the possibility of Catholic same-sex blessings. And when asked whether the Synod could approve the blessing of same-sex couples and the ordination of women, he said this, no. But the Church already knows that answer. Before the Synod, a few days before, they published the Pope's answers to some questions or doubts that some cardinals had raised. And there are also these questions in such a way that what the Pope wants is for us to handle with great respect and great delicacy the questions that people have in their hearts, and that we answer them with so much respect that no one is offended, that everyone has clear in their minds the why of things. The Synod cannot remove pages from the Bible. The Synod does not have that kind of authority, nor does the Pope remotely want that, Archbishop Jose Gomez Rodriguez said. Um, the Archbishop seems to be making a reasonable argument here, Bob, but hasn't Pope Francis already given his blessing to these matters, by his words, at least? Look, there, it's, it, it's impossible for any organization not to offend someone. I mean, unless it's such a spineless, empty organization that it doesn't really stand for anything. Some people are offended by mm. Jesus Christ him, himself and were while he was alive on, on this earth. So that, that to, the, to take that approach, it seems to me, is to overly um, emphasize something that cannot happen realistically in our world. Uh, look, there was a, a Latvian bishop at the press uh, briefing yesterday for the Synod, and he laid out in what I thought was the clearest, most gentle uh, way that you could ask for, what, what kind of blessing can you give people who are same-sex attractive? He says if a single person mm -hmm. comes along and wants to live a chaste life and wants the graces to, to be able to do that, yeah, you can bless that person. If two people come along who want to remain chaste in their uh, uh, affection for one another, you can bless that as well. But if you get to the point where you're going to be blessing an actual civil union or something that looks like marriage, you obviously can't do that. Now, I wish the Holy Father would say that, because if he were to lay it out with that degree of clarity, I think all of us would get behind him and say, okay, look, that's well, fine. Well, Bob, the Pope, but in the fact, Pope what, has what said we're constantly... we can't... 
but, but well, let's wait a second. The Pope did say you can you can't bless this so that it looks like you're blessing a, a, a gay marriage. He did say that. The problem is he didn't add the other qualifiers that you're mentioning there, there and that that bishop mentioned. Yeah, but, but it, it, it doesn't look like a, a gay marriage to whom? <laughs> because, as we know, uh, you know, Whoopi Goldberg walked out of her conversation with the Pope and think he, thinks he, he, he loves same-sex unions and, and he, uh, he supports women deaconesses and, you know, all of this stuff that may or may not be true. We don't mm -hmm. know what he said with her. But, um, I, I mean, look... We know that in the world, the way, the way that the secular press and the world as a whole will regard the blessing of two people, especially if they come forward publicly in a parish, and we know that in the Anglican Church they, this morphed from a kind of a, a, you know, a very quiet type of blessing to full-scale exchange of rings and, and after-blessing after dinners, I mean, that looked exactly like a, like a wedding. So I think you have to say there's a slippery, slippery slope here, because, because on the one hand, you're going to deny that this is like a wedding, but it is very likely to move very qu quickly in the public mind and in actual practice to being ersatz marriage. Mm. Bob, we will leave it there for commentary by Robert Royal, Father Gerald Murray, uh, and regular Synod podcasts from Rome. Visit thecatholicthing.org. Bob, we'll see you next week. Yeah, thank you, Raymond. A little good news. I am so excited that my new Christmas album, Christmas Merry and Bright, because of you, is on the top of Billboard's jazz charts, the holiday charts, and it's the number one jazz vocal album on Amazon. Uh, this is a project so dear to my heart. I know it will enrich your Christmas. We'll talk more about it in the days ahead. Um, you can go to Spotify, Barnes & Noble, Amazon, EWTN's catalog, Apple Music, wherever you get your music. And you can also come and see me on tour starting in late November. I'll be traveling with the band RaymondArroyoChristmas.com. I'm going to Phoenix and Nashville and Cleveland and Tampa and Dallas. Come see us. It's all there on the site. More in the days ahead. Here to dive deeper into the Synod and talk about a new book he's edited celebrating the late George Cardinal Pell. Pell Contramundum is the president emeritus of the Acton Institute, Father Robert Sirico. He joins us from Rome. Father, thank you for being here. Before we get to the book, I want to get your take on a few other happenings around the Synod. Two bishops from China left the assembly earlier than scheduled this week yes. due to what was billed as pastoral concerns in the home diocese. Pope Francis appointed them to the Synod himself. They were chosen, of course, from a pre-approved list by the Chinese Communist government. This premature exit was similar to the one that occurred at a Synod gathering in Rome back in 2018, exactly. shortly after the consummation of that infamous Vatican-China agreement. What is the message being sent here, in your estimation? Evidently, the message is that the uh the Chinese Communist government doesn't think this is important enough for them to have people here for too long a period of time. Uh, you remember that when Cardinal Zen came for the funeral of Pope Benedict, he was allowed five, hour, five days. So he arrived, went directly from the airport to the funeral, uh, the next day met with the Pope, and then went back to the airport and got back to China. So uh, I think it's a, a slight. Well, it also might indicate uh, something about the nature of the secret terms of that agreement with Rome. It, it, it feels like it's a who's the boss kind of game being played here. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, talk about secrecy. I mean, the whole <laughs> the whole discussion at the Senate is is very complex. Uh, the whole method and the way in which they do it, and then they keep tapping down on uh, people. Uh, not being open and speaking um, their hearts and their mm -hmm. minds. Yeah, no, it's an amazing, uh, you know, confluence of influences as well as uh, suppression of some information and then, uh, you know, overexposure of others. Father, I spoke with Robert Royal about this earlier. Right. The idea of priorities. Pope Francis has refused to meet with key cardinals, including Cardinal Zen. Uh, I know reporters who've requested interviews as well with the Pope, uh, all of which he's refused. Contrast that with the lengthy meeting he had this week with dissident Catholic nun, Sister Janine Gramick of New Ways Ministries, and even Hollywood star Whoopi Goldberg, yes. who uh, told him she's taking nuns into the 21st century. Father Sirico, your take 
on these choices right. the Pope makes with his time and given your knowledge of media and business, how damaging is this to the optics of the papacy as well as in the midst of this synod? Well, of course, from my perspective, it's damaging. I'm sure from another perspective, this is exactly what the Holy Father wants to project, that he's sending a message without saying anything, without making an argument, just by the selection of the people he chooses to meet with, and generally the people who are giving uh, meditations and reflections during the course of the uh, Synod. So this is very well calibrated, really. What do you think that message is? What do you think he's trying to convey without saying? I, I think he's trying to say the church is on the move. <laughs> the question is, and, and he, he really developed this thought recently in one interview where he talked about uh, the church has to change. It has to go forward. Yeah. And it needs to leave behind certain things. And the, the problem is that we don't have the kind of boundaries and the safeguards in place as to what is it that's going to change. I mean, can, can the church... Uh, create the idea of a fourth person of the Blessed Trinity? I mean, I, I'm sure the Holy Father is going to say no to that, but what are the criteria? How, how do you know, how do you discern mm -hmm. an authentic development from an aberration? Right. Yeah. And Cardinal Newman and others have been very clear on what the pattern of that development would look like. This doesn't seem to satisfy it. But anyway, uh, I need to get your thoughts on your friend, Chinese Catholic freedom fighter Jimmy Lai. Jimmy's been a prisoner of course, viewers of this yes. show know, a prisoner of the Chinese Communist government for over a thousand days now, reaching that milestone at the end of September. Yes. Lai is now 75 years old. Father, you produced this fantastic documentary, The Hong Konger, about Jimmy Lai. How is he doing, and do you see him ever being released at this point? As a matter of fact, we just had a premiere of the Hong Konger here in Rome to a packed house including about, um, I, I suppose there were eight uh, ambassadors who were present, a uh, good bit of media, and the people were really moved by this. Um, the sad thing is, now they've moved his trial. It was a, supposed to take place right about now in October, but they moved the trial to December, and if I'm not mistaken, it's the 18th of December. And uh, you ask me if I think he'll ever be out... Um, I pray so. I've been working very hard to raise the awareness of his struggle and encouraging people to uh, call to free Jimmy Lai, uh, but it, it doesn't look very good. I, I think uh, if we hear that he is extradited to mainland China, I think that, that says everything that will be said on the subject. Well, Father, given the Vatican-China agreement, how does Jimmy Lai's witness contrast with the Vatican's seemingly permissive attitude toward this dictatorship in China? Well, I, you know, it, it's a stark contrast, isn't it? And it's not just the dictatorship in China. I mean, you have uh, just today, uh, I think it was 12 priests who were released from Nicaraguan uh, prisons uh, and exiled to Rome. The bishop who was arrested is, is elected to stay. Uh, in Nicaragua. Mm. Uh, there's relative silence about that. I haven't heard any press uh, yep. coverage or any Vatican statements on that. So we see this as a pattern. The, the thing is that Jimmy Lai is giving witness. He's a white martyr. In fact, in the book, which we'll talk about in a moment, Cardinal Gracias yeah. from uh, uh, Bombay uh, who described... Uh, referred to Cardinal Pell that way. George Cardinal Pell is a white martyr. And I think that Jimmy Lai is a white martyr as well. Yeah, yeah. You're getting ahead of me, Father. But let's move on to the book. Uh, you edited this new book that celebrates the thought okay. of the late George Cardinal Pell, Pell Contra Mundum, Pell Against the World. In it, you highlight Cardinal Pell's role as a defender of orthodoxy in chaotic and confusing times. I mean, he certainly was a prophet. Uh, I spoke with him on the show in June of 2021. And I asked Cardinal Pell then about the German synodal way, but not even he could imagine that the aberrations in the German church would soon be embraced by the global synod in Rome as well. Watch this. I don't know whether abortion and euthanasia are on the books. Uh, I hope not. But uh, certainly 
They want to change the teaching on uh, some do, on sexual morality by blessing homosexual unions. Uh, they object to the tough teachings of Jesus on uh, adultery and against remarriage. Uh, they seem to have a different list of uh, qualities that are necessary for the fruitful reception of the sacraments, different from that of St. Paul. And some of them would uh, want to have an order of w women priests. Now, uh, we can't have a German set of the Ten Commandments, and we uh, can't have a, uh, a set of uh, women priests in Germany and nowhere, nowhere else. Father, your reaction to that, particularly that line, they want to change church teaching, it's really haunting. Yeah, it, it's so good to hear his voice. And isn't it remarkable that uh, you said that was in June and here it could be the, the front page of the news today because now it's moved not just from Germany, it's moved from Germany to the universal church because this is exactly the kind right. of thing with great ambiguity too because at the beginning they said, no, we're not here to change church teaching. But now as we've gone through two and almost three weeks of the synod, we see this coming to the fore, that we're laying the foundations, one cardinal said, for the changes that will take place and will address those concrete changes he said next year, because remember that the Senate is in two parts, so there'll be in 2024, there'll be another part of it. But that's exactly why I edited this book. I was with the Cardinal, um, you know, quite a bit just before he died. And um, these were the concerns that were uh, on his mind that he wrote about. In fact, uh, the essay that he wrote for the London Spectator is the uh, lead uh, article in this uh, book. Yep. And, and Father, talk, talk for a moment about the significance of that Latin title, Pell Contra Mundum. Um, I mean, you include three addresses here by Cardinal of course. Pell, all given in the last six months of his life. But go ahead, tell me about the title. Why yes. that? Yes. Well, of course, Pell Contra Mundum is a play on the Athanasius Contra Mundum, because remember that Athanasius... Um, was very concerned at the Council of Nicaea when the whole world, Jerome said, the whole world woke up and found itself Arian. So this, the Arian heresy was the denial of the deity of Jesus Christ, a very core fundamental part of the church's deposit of revelation. And, and um, Athanasius fought against that uh, under very difficult circumstances. He was exiled twice, and the phrase emerged Athanasius contra mundum. So I saw that this was exactly the role that Pell was playing, and I wanted to ensure that his voice would still be heard mm. at this synod, which is why this book is published in four languages and has been distributed to every cardinal throughout the world. You contributed your own essay to the book, as did George Weigel and the Archbishop of Bombay, Cardinal uh, Gracias, yes. you mentioned him earlier. And uh, in that essay by Cardinal Gracias, titled George Pell, White Martyr. Um, he goes into some of the uh, really delicate and, and heartbreaking details of the time Pell spent in prison in Australia for crimes he didn't commit and how that shaped the man he yes. would become in his final years of his life. Reflect on that essay, if you would. Uh, well, he pointed out the 404 days were like a retreat for Pell. That's what Pell said. And it produced these three volumes of very uh, rich spiritual reflections uh, on his time in prison. And what you see there in, in yeah, a very mundane reflection uh, uh, on his time there and uh, his attachment to the truth of Jesus Christ. Um, so uh, I think it's a very powerful witness in that he comes out without rancor, without hatred uh, and uh, toward anyone. And uh, mm -hmm. I, he's a great model in that Cardinal Gracious, who knew the man well and didn't always agree with him, uh, acknowledges mm -hmm. that. Yeah. In your essay, Father, you write uh, the essential question Pell labored to raise in his last days comes down to this. Does the church exist by virtue of a divine mandate, a deposit of faith entrusted to the apostles intended from the beginning to be handed down faithfully from one generation to another intact? Father, up until now, it seems that 
Cardinal Pell, and we in the church would count on that continuity and could. What do you think is the answer to that question today, now as this synod closes? Well, the, the, this is what we all pledge. This is what we pledge in our, our baptismal uh, promises at Easter. We pledge it in our priestly ordinations. This is the fundamental of the faith. And this is being explicitly negotiated away in the name of modern research and openness and walking with people. Now, we want to be open to people. We want uh, to walk with people who are hurt. We want to embrace those who are on the margins. It's not a question of whether we love people or don't love people. It's a, it's a question of whether we uh, propose to them the truth of Jesus Christ. And the truth of Jesus Christ is stable. It's dependable. And it is unalterable. And it can be developed and applied in different circumstances, of course, but we have to have that uh, continuity of teaching and the safeguards around that, which, and in that essay, I also draw the connection to Newman, because uh, in many ways, Pell was like a Newman. He, uh, he was not afraid to engage the issues of his day. He was in court. Uh, Newman was in court. Uh, he um, wrote himself into the Catholic Church precisely on this point of the development of Christian doctrine. How does it authentically mm -hmm. develop? How does it go from the implicit to the explicit? Not a change or a reversal of its teaching and its insight, but an amplification and a clarification of the truths of the faith. That's what Newman mm -hmm. was about. Mm -hmm. That's precisely what Pell was about. And Newman, you'll remember, was called the silent father of the Second Vatican Council. My mm -hmm. effort is to ensure that Pell's voice is here, that he is here as a silent father of this synod. Before we go, you include an essay written by Cardinal Pell right before he passed. It was published posthumously. It was titled, The Catholic Church Must Free Itself from This Toxic Nightmare, referencing the synod. It includes the ominous warning to his brother bishops, yes. quote, the synods have to choose whether they are servants and defenders of the apostolic tradition on faith and morals or whether their discernment compels them to assert a sovereignty over Catholic teaching. So far, the synodal way has neglected, indeed downgraded, the transcendent covered up the centrality of Christ with appeals to the Holy Spirit and encouraged resentment, especially among the participants. Father Sirico, the first portion of this Synod on Synodality is wrapping up next week. How prophetic are those words, and what do you want readers to take from this Pell Contra Mundum, this book? Uh, astoundingly prophetic. I mean, he, he nails it completely. Remember, he died uh, in, in January. There's almost a year. And he nailed the thing precisely. And this is a call to bishops to be bishops, to be another Athanasius, to stand against the trends. And uh, I think this is what's up for grabs. You know, it's they're, they're not really even having any theological debates. And that's not an accusation on my part. That's, that's their self-definition of what's going on here. By them, I mean the organizers. I think there's mm -hmm. a subterranean concern I have heard. I've met with many bishops over the time that I've been here in Rome. And there is concern. They're trying to be prudent and certainly respectful of the office of the Holy Father. But... Um, We'll see what happens in the next few days. I, I, I know that there's tension in certain places. Yeah. Well, we'll see how all this shakes out. And again, this is the greatest uh, cliffhanger ever because you've got to wait a full year for anything to happen. So we will leave it there. Pel Contra Mundum, edited by Father Robert Sirico, is available now at bookstores everywhere and online. Father, thank you for being here. Good to be with you, Raymond. And I want to remind you, The Magnificent Mischief of Tad Lincoln is out in stores now, my new book. It's a wonderful read for families, particularly with the holidays approaching. And it really is a book about finding hope and joy in dark times. That's what Tad Lincoln's Magnificent Mischief is all about. Uh, I hope it gives you hope. I hope it also describes the origins of a national holiday tradition and enriches the holidays for your family. You can find it now at Barnes & Noble, Amazon, the EWTN catalog, wherever books are sold. Visit RaymondArroyo.com for details. 
He's the former Anglican Bishop of Durham in the UK and currently a senior research fellow at Wycliffe Hall at Oxford. He also happens to be one of the world's foremost authorities on the letters of St. Paul. He joins me tonight to talk about his brand new book, Into the Heart of Romans, a deep dive into Paul's greatest letter. Please welcome to the program, Professor N.T. Wright. Tom, thank you for being here. Um, as I mentioned, you thank are you. one of the world's leading biblical scholars, the foremost interpreter of St. Paul. Why and what makes Romans his greatest letter in your estimation? Well, R Romans is Paul's longest letter. That doesn't necessarily make it the greatest. But when you study mm -hmm. all the letters, Romans is the one above all, which seems to have been planned very, very carefully. Um, as a writer myself and as somebody who studied also uh, music and symphonies and so on, I have to say that Romans is structured extremely carefully into what you might call, musically speaking, four movements, uh, one to four, five mm. to eight, nine to 11, 12 to 16. And, and they each have their own coherence, but then they interrelate in the way that the movements of a symphony would interrelate. And I, I imagine that Paul had had this boiling up in his head for some years beforehand, and phrases in the letter um, um, marry up with phrases in the other letters, but he's here brought them together to make one single coherent argument to the, the churches in Rome, and he's worried about the churches in Rome because um, th they are a bit suspicious of each other, the small house churches, and he wants them to get together together and learn to worship together and so on. And uh, mm. the, 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 the theological argument that he pulls together has sustained uh, theologians and church leaders from that time to this. I mean, famously, St. Augustine and Martin Luther and John Wesley and all sorts of people, and not to mention Karl Barth in the last century, have found that Romans has been the thing which have galvanized them into fresh thought and action and reorganization of how they preach and goodness knows what. So I think by common consent, Romans is the big one, and it's been the privilege of my life, really, mm. academically and personally, to be able to, to, to wallow around in it. Mm. Uh, Tom, tell me how St. Paul, in the letter to Romans, how he echoes the Old Testament, particularly the Psalms, which you reference in the book. Yeah. He, he, uh, Paul was soaked in, in what we call the Old Testament, for him the Bible, of course, and he actually knows the Old Testament both in Hebrew and in the Greek version, I think particularly in the Greek version because that was the lingua franca of the day. Um, and he, he, like the other early Christians, he draws together several of the, of the Psalms again and again, and one in particular which always strikes me in Romans 8 now is Psalm 8 when he has this uh, the, the psalmist has the vision of the human vocation. Uh, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you take thought for him? You've made him little lower than the angels to crown him with glory and honor, putting all things under his feet. And Paul has this vision of the original creation with humans being God's agents in bringing about his will in the world. And then when it all goes horribly wrong, God doesn't change that plan. He rescues humans so that through rescued humans, the world can be put right. And so he's woven that mm. into the way he, he sets out chapter 8. It's elsewhere as well. But the mm. other thing in chapter 8, which is very striking, is that um, the Psalms, of course, have a lot of lament, asking God, why on earth is mm. this happening? What's gone wrong? And one of the lament Psalms is Psalm 44. And Paul echoes Psalm 44 twice in Romans 8, one time when he's talking about how when the world is groaning, as our world is groaning right now, then the people People of God mm -hmm. are groaning within themselves, and God himself is groaning within, uh, within our hearts. And he says, God who searches the hearts knows what the Holy Spirit is thinking. That's a, a reference to Psalm 44. And then later in the chapter, he says, for your sake, we are being killed all day long and reckoned as sheep for the slaughter. That again is Psalm 44. So Paul is seeing both the grandeur of the human vocation and the suffering of the people of God as coming through from from the Old Testament into the experience both of Jesus himself in his suffering and death and then his ascension and then of his faithful followers. This is just a little pinprick, but that gives you an idea of what's going on there. Yeah. We've seen in the Middle East, of course, the, the birthplace of Jesus torn apart by violence and suffering in recent days. What message from Romans? deepens our biblical understanding of human suffering and the promise of ultimate glory with God. 
Oh, my. It, it, I was afraid you were going to ask me this because, of course, we can't avoid the question because it has been so horrendous. Yeah. And uh, uh, yeah. just we in the UK are grieving over all sorts of things that are happening. And I know that you in the US are, are as well. Um, mm -hmm. But in the middle of it all, uh, Romans has this message that despite the mess that the world is in, the God who made the world, the God who made the covenant with Abraham, um, etc., etc., this God is righteous. He has done the right thing for the world in Jesus. He is doing the right thing for the world now. And the church has the vocation, not necessarily to be able to tell the rest of the world that it's getting it wrong, but to live as the faithful people of God and particularly the peacemaking people of God. And, and that vocation of the church to be the people who can hang on to the suffering and pain of the world and hold it in lament before God and then can live in such a way as to be reconcilers and peacemakers. I have no idea how the church in the Middle East is facing up to that challenge at the moment, but it seems to me it, it ought to be a global call to the whole church to be praying for peace at this time. Mm. And if we can, to be working for peace, to be writing letters, to be lobbying people uh, mm -hmm. for any means of, of actually bringing peace in that troubled land. Tom, uh, we have seen both in the Anglican Communion as well as in the Catholic Church with the Synod on Synodality ongoing, um, there seems to be a, a desire to accommodate the world, if you will, uh, in so many ways. There's a line in chapter 12 of Romans where St. Paul says, do not conform yourselves to this age, but to be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and pleasing and perfect. Um, what would St. Paul say, do you think, as we see these <laughs> ruptures well. of communion, as we see the, um, uh, the, the, the tossing off at times of doctrines and practice that are part of classic Christianity as we've known it? On the one hand, there is that clear imperative at the beginning of Romans 12, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Of course, the question is, who says what counts as conformity or being transformed? And there are different opinions mm. about that. And later on in the chapter, Paul also says, if it be possible, as far as it lies with you, live at peace with all people. And it seems to me again and again, we're caught between those two, that we quite rightly want to be peaceful peacemakers and to be peace livers. But there are certain times, and the church has always known this, when the church has to say, no, actually, that's the way of the world. But God is creating a new version of humanity, which is the new uh, the return to the original dream for the human race, if you like. And we mm -hmm. in Christ and by the Spirit are supposed to be modeling and living that. And then when you look at the rest of Paul's writings, it's pretty obvious in terms of some of the debates where Paul would come out on them. But that call to transformation is there in Romans, it's there in Philippians, interestingly, particularly, mm -hmm. where Paul is really encouraging people not just to drift with the, uh, the, the, the winds of passing fashion, but actually to learn not just what to think, but how to think, how to think in Christ, mm -hmm. how to have your thinking formed by the death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus. And again and again, it's much easier for the church just to slide along with the way the, the world is doing things. I'm not saying that's what's happening at the moment, because I say I haven't followed the debates, but that is always the challenge. And again and again, as yeah. we look at church history, it's when the church has said, no, actually, the way of transformed humanity looks like this. That's when the church has been true and faithful to the gospel. Yeah. And, and at times, as you mentioned in the book, that can bring on a fair amount of suffering. But that, too, is part of the journey, part of Christ's model, part of St. Paul's yeah. witness to us. Were there any breakthrough moments that you experienced as you wrote into the heart of Romans. For me, the, the breakthrough moment was a fresh reading of the middle section of chapter 8, which is a lot about mm. suffering, uh, as you mentioned. Of course, mm. part of the problem with saying that suffering is part of the deal is that sometimes Christians have suffered for reasons which were nothing to do with the gospel. It was just because they were being right. obstreperous or awkward or whatever. And uh, mm -hmm. it, it's then a matter of discernment. Is this suffering happening because we're being faithful or despite the fact that we're being or because we're being stupid or whatever? But then for mm -hmm. me, <laughs> 
Um, I had read, as many have, I had read the whole chapter as being simply about salvation, whereas in fact verses 12 to 30, which is the long middle section of chapter 8, mm -hmm. are really about vocation. They're about what is the church there for? And the church is there to be the new model of the human race in the face of the wild and woolly world which is doing its own stuff. And so the wild and woolly world is going to um, dislike that intensely and is going to pour out suffering on them. And Paul is writing in the middle or, or, or oh. even the late 50s, uh, first century. And within a decade, the church in Rome suffered agonizingly because of the persecution under the Emperor Nero. So Paul, I think, had a premonition mm. of that. But part of that vocation is to be the people who he says are conformed to the image of the Son, which is Christ on the cross, and that somehow the suffering of Christ on the cross, which won redemption for the world, has to be lived out again by the Spirit in the followers of Jesus who go through this same thing so that the love of God may be present in the midst of the wounded and suffering world. And that vocation is something that the church at its best has often known about, but people haven't always seen it in Romans because in the long traditions of interpretation, people have simply seen that as, oh, well, we're on the way to heaven, and so this is how we get there. We've got to go through a dark patch to get there. But actually, Romans 8 yeah. isn't about going to heaven. It's about how the life of heaven in the person of the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within us to bring us to be the people that God wants us to be. Mm. N.T. Wright, Always a pleasure. Thank you for being here. Into the Heart of Romans, a deep dive into Paul's greatest letter by N.T. Wright is out in stores now and online at all the book outlets. Thank you again, Tom. Thank you very much. Good to be with you. That is all the time we have for now. Be sure to catch us for Synod Central, the final week next week. Until then, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, thank you for watching. I'm Raymond Arroyo. I know. To order this episode of The World Over from the EWTN Religious Catalog web store, log on to EWTNRC.com 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, or call 1-800-854-6316. There's nothing like EWTN's National Catholic Register. Revealing, engaging, inspiring. The most comprehensive news of the day from a Catholic perspective anywhere in print. With the moral authority that comes from being faithful to the teachings of the Catholic Church. And in the words of our founder, Monsignor Matthew Smith, a paper that will always be loyal to the church and has no selfish acts to grind. Because the truth when the register was founded in 1927 is still the truth today. The award-winning National Catholic Register helps readers engage the culture with confidence in the saving and sanctifying gospel of Jesus Christ. Increase your knowledge, deepen your faith with the National Catholic Register. Get six free issues today by ordering online at ncregister.com forward slash TV or call 800-421-3230 and mention code 